from the number one best-selling author of Life Rescripted. You are now tuning in to the Year of Purpose podcast. I'm Zephan Moses Blacksburg. Today, I'm hanging out with Brian and Jen Danger, and these are the dangers. They quit their jobs and left normal society to drive their 67 Volkswagen bus through Mexico and Central America, and they thought that they'd probably end up living on a beach and never coming back, and they almost did, but as it turns out, they realized that their home in Portland, uh, where their tribe is, was just as important to them as travel, and so they've spent the last few years creating a home base in Portland and trying to ensure that they never again have to take jobs that they dislike and uh, thank you guys so much for being here today. You know, I, I think disliking your job is a very common uh, denominator between many of our listeners right now and uh, a lot of people just today alone. So thanks for being here, Brian and Jen. Yes, yeah, absolutely. our pleasure. You know, Zephan, when we meet people who say, I love my job, we are so, it just fills us with joy because you don't hear that very often. <laughs> and we always tell them, like, that is really awesome to hear. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with a job if it suits you, right? But, you know, so many people have jobs that they absolutely hate and it's just for the money. You know, there there is no other real reason to to be there other than, you know, getting a paycheck. So if you love your job, then totally stick with it. You know, don't take our advice and just go quit. Yeah. And and appreciate that you have found that for yourself because it is it is rare. Yeah, totally. So what types of jobs were you guys working before all this went down? Like, where were you in life and and what kind of led to this uh, decision to leave? We're both working pretty, you know, kind of corporate North America jobs, jobs that, uh, you know, I think the, the average person would say we should have been pretty happy to have. Yep. But, you know, we're working 60, 80 hours a week under fluorescent lights. I was traveling a ton for work but not the type of travel that you you know can get excited about more like a new state every day new rental car new hotel um just kind of seeing the same old thing and and Jen wasn't able to join me for it and you know we just kept trying to we tried everything to try and make it fit to just kind of say gosh there's got to be a way we can just do this like you know quote unquote normal people and it just it never fit. We couldn't kind of force ourselves, you know, square peg, round hole, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And and so what, you know, when you say corporate was there, you know, did you guys have a background in, in one particular area that, um, you know, has any of that like carried over to where you guys are now? Or is that kind of like a totally different story of the past? No, it's 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 almost like a, a completely second life or third life or fourth yeah. life. Okay. I, I worked for different sporting good companies and different outdoor brands. And I worked on the product team, but in numbers. So I was crunching numbers and forecasting future sales and things like that. And Brian was in a consulting firm. Um, and their, their main focus was education. Okay. So, I mean, we had, we had great jobs. They just didn't suit us because we were thinking there's got to be more to our everyday existence. Definitely. And so did you guys ever have experiences before then where you had really gotten to travel or, you know, see what else is out there? Um, Or was this really kind of the first time where you were like, you know, this is our chance to go see the world? Well, I mean, we certainly tried to take the most opportunity we could from our two weeks of vacation a year. And so, you know, we, we would go and it. <laughs> we would optimize. We'd go, you know, try and scuba dive, hit the islands, you know, take a trip to Thailand. And Jen was able to meet me for, I don't know, one or two international trips over a course of 14 years. But, um, you know, it, it's not like we didn't know the world was out there. It just seemed like we were so far removed from it. Yeah, absolutely. Every time we traveled, it was for, you know, 10 days to two weeks. And, you know, once you get like three quarters of the way through that vacation, you already start to start thinking about your jobs and your to do lists. And it just never felt like it was long enough or that we were able to release enough from that from that daily life. Yeah, no, I mean, I've I know that feeling of 
wanting a break or you know wishing you were on the beach especially I'm on the east coast right now so this time of year you know it gets very snowy and cold and rainy and I I would kill to be in a hammock with you know a, a nice glass of something yeah so I I definitely get that feeling and and that was something that was huge for me too and in, in leaving my job behind so when you guys made this decision, like who was the first person to come home and say, all right, we got to do this. Oh, Jen, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, she gets upset often the way I describe this, but I think for the better part of a decade, she was kind of pulling and tugging and, you know, saying, let's just drop it all and leave. And I, I just thought that was crazy hippie talk, you know, I mean, what, <laughs> there's a reason we're working. What about our 401k and our retirement and, you know, all these things that, obviously we've spent our life trying to do. Um, and, and it just, it took me a long time. She has no fear in the world about this type of thing. And I just, I couldn't let go of the, the normalcy and the fear. And so, you know, my kind of consolation was, well, let's, you know, not leave today, but let's, you know, spend the next few years downsizing and purging and downsizing more and saving money and at least make sure we have enough of a you know, a, a, a travel fund to be gone for a while, but also that we could come back and, you know, have padding if we had to go back and find another job. Uh, you know, so coming back wasn't suddenly more stressful than before we left. Right. And I'm sure you found that you really didn't need that safety net once you guys went out because, you know, it, it seems like things have really changed for the better in that you haven't had to go back to that style of job. No, far from it. Brian, um, Brian's still surprised every day because when we left, he just he just really thought that we would, after a year or two, we would go back and life as before would continue. But I quite the contrary. Yeah, quite the contrary. And I always felt like you know, let's go take a year or two and mix it up and be wild and crazy and 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 do something completely different. And maybe we will choose that lifestyle again maybe we want to go back you know to you know a company where we're trying to really help optimize their sales and bring success to them and that will bring us joy and you know be a part of that normal society path that hasn't happened but that hasn't happened <laughs> the opposite in fact brian sometimes says oh now we're broken <laughs> now we can never go back to normalcy <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like when I went on my first cruise ever, we went on at the time what was the largest cruise ship. And so, you know, we went to this comedy show one night and he's like, who here, is, you know, it's your first time on the cruise. And of course, we raise our hands and he turns to us and he's like, so like, this is it. Like, you can't go on any other cruises now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, definitely. And so... um since since Brian wasn't the first to say, all right, we've got to do this, like where was, you know, the turning point for you, Brian, where it was like, all right, like I've had enough, we've we've been prepping for this long enough, um, you know, it's time to do this. I think the first the, the first thing that brought me over to the the dark side, the light side, I guess. <laughs> I don't um I mean just I had a routine checkup uh, after work one day and walked into the doctor and he literally was like, so anybody ever tell you you might have high blood pressure? I mean, like, obviously we have to do some more tests to be sure, but it, it pretty much seems like you should be on medication right now. And yeah, I just kind of... In your early 30s. I mean, yeah, early 30s. And I, my, my eyes just kind of rolled back in my head and I got real quiet and went home and was just like, okay, I'm in. And at that point is when we kind of said, okay, you know, what, what would it take? Let's look at some blogs and see kind of how much people spend when they're on the road how much we'd have to save for a couple of years. You know, it was still important for me to have that foundation of the security blanket. Um, but I was pretty committed. I mean, don't get me wrong. We still, this was, this was right around the, uh, the housing crash. Mm -hmm. And so we had, we had moments of terror where we kind of aborted and postponed and then came back at it and things like that. It wasn't, it still wasn't an easy thing. Um, but I think every day after that appointment, I was, committed to making it work. I remember also we had two really good friends who, while, we, while we're still working but thinking about you know, leaving that behind, we had two really good friends who lost their jobs. And that really 
spoke to us too. Like, are we being careless? Like, should we be more appreciative to have the work? But really when it came down to like checking in with ourselves and listening to our hearts, we had to just keep moving forward and, and follow, follow those voices. <laughs> That's cool. And so you, you had mentioned a little bit about how, you know, your concerns for a 401k and retirement and savings and things like that. Um, so I, I guess my question is, you know, I'm 26. Many of the people in my age group are very concerned with this. You know, they're just a few years removed from college. So they're going off of this idea that their parents set them up with for, you know, you have to get a good job. You have to save up all your money and build this retirement and buy a stock portfolio. You know, what do you guys have to say just as far as, um, you know, anyone who's kind of stuck in that mentality of we have to do this the way that everyone has done it in the past? Um. <laughs> doesn't do you any good if you're not here to enjoy it, <laughs> I guess. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I come from a family that had all of those same underlying premises. And I, you know, very clearly remember every single month, every single year, listening to my parents talk about how when they retire, they're going to move into their camper and travel the world. And they're going to travel at least the States and drive around and see everything. And they've now been retired for I don't know, uh, 15 years, and they've yet to take more than a trip a state away uh, because, you know, things come up and it's difficult to do. And at, at least for me, it's, it's always kind of an ever-present, like now's the time. And quite honestly, if I, I mean, I in, in all reality believe that if I was still working that job, I would have at least had my first heart attack by now, if not subsequent heart attacks by now. Uh, the stress was just that high. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's fair to think about that other side, but it's also fair to say that since we left, it's, it's eye opening to me that opportunities create themselves if you're able to look for them and see them and take advantage of them. And when we were working our jobs, I don't doubt that opportunities were, were going by us all the time, but we were, you know, we were exhausted and we just didn't have kind of the ability to, to reach out and grab them. And so, you know, I, I recently referred to this as feeling before, like we were walking through a, you know, a, a dark forest with a really dim flashlight. And so everything was horrifying because we couldn't see a few steps in front of us. Um, and, you know, if you keep going and you kind of trust that it's going to work out, every step you take, you get a little further along, your eyes adjust to the darkness a little bit. Uh, your flashlight suddenly seems stronger than it did before, and you keep seeing, you know, new paths ahead of you. And, and you know, now I sound like I'm the hippie instead of Jen, but, <laughs> um, you know, it's it's just weird how things begin to open up for you the further you get away from what you've just always known had to be true. Um, and, and, you know, we don't have, we don't have all the answers, we don't have any figured out, but I do, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid now. You know, I believe that, <laughs> that this is actually possible and that there are paths out there and, you know, we're still figuring out the, the nuances, but we're so impossibly happy that there's no way I would try and pull us back the other way. Yeah. And I, th one of the quotes that I always say, and this is, you know, obviously from someone else, but it was, you don't know what you don't know. And the fact that you were able to jump into this experience uh, with that sort of flashlight mentality of, you know, I have to take another step for the flash flashlight to reach a little further. Uh, I think that's a great way to dive into anything. And Didn't know that at the time, let's be clear. But in right. hindsight, it, it, yeah. it seems more clear every day. Yeah, so it's one of those things that you can never tell looking into the future what it's going to look like. Um, you know, you just kind of have to keep moving towards it. So what was the reasoning behind you guys got a VW bus? What, what was the reasoning behind that? And then uh, maybe just kind of share a little bit about um, like how long ago that original trip kind of started and, and where that took you guys. Yeah, we, we left our jobs in 2012. We had started outfitting the van, I don't know, a year or two before that. Um, and we, we kind of just you know, we're going to go live on the road. We need a vehicle. 
Um, we need something we can sleep in. Our, our car didn't allow that. And so we started looking at, you know, taco trucks that would blend in, um, box trucks that, you know, we could put some delivery name on the side of, I mean, we looked at everything, <laughs> but the more I kind of read about the more, you know, it kept, I kept stumbling upon this thing that in, you know, Mexico and Central America, VW bus, the old school VW bus with no, none of the technology, you know, can be fixed by anybody. And so it's an easy way to make sure you can stay on the road. Um, and then we just, you know, we went and toured a Westphalia and we looked at a few different V dubs and, you know, then we made the mistake of climbing into a split window. Um, and the visual kind of artist in me just fell in love with it. And so I think from the second we saw one, there was never going to be another choice. Um, <laughs> and so we, you know, we finally found one that was a decent price and we outfitted the inside, uh, as a camper and, it, it actually was the perfect vehicle for that road trip. And I don't know if it's necessarily because, um, you know, of, of what I thought is that it would be on the road all the time. Cause I think we broke down every three days on average. <laughs> um, but it also helped, you know, it, it set its own schedule. And so we couldn't decide to be somewhere on a certain day. We couldn't keep a certain pace. We couldn't even keep up with other travelers. Um, and somehow in, in, I don't know. It just, it helped us remove. And so those first few months, I don't think we'll ever forget those first few months in Baja where we're just, you know, we're, we left at an odd time of year. So there literally were no other travelers. There's nobody that spoke English, um, hot as blazes, which is why there was nobody there. And our vehicle kept breaking down every few days and somehow, you know, just sitting on a beach until we had enough things fixed to move to the next beach. Um, it just allowed us to kind of decompress and realize that we were in a different place and kind of start to open our eyes and, you know, embrace that newness as opposed to, I mean, I think it took a good couple of months before we finally realized we didn't have a call that we had to be on the next day. Yeah. After years and years of deadlines and structure and routine and, you know, racing around trying to be on time for everything and juggling all of that, it was really, it was really opposite to be driving a Volkswagen bus that you just never had any idea when it was going to break down and you're in the middle of nowhere and you don't speak fluently the language. We knew a little bit, um, but we learned to just roll with it and that, that made a big difference in our, it was huge yeah. in our psyches. <laughs> yeah. And it's got to be so different from you know, here, my first thought, if my car breaks down is, you know, call AAA, right? Like get somebody here right away, pull the phone out, figure this out, get me out of here. And it, now I don't necessarily have beaches as close to me on the East Coast right now where I'm at. But uh, if if I broke down, I'd probably want to be able to say, eh, well, we're on the beach. Let's make a fire and hang out for a little bit. Yeah, and we, we were always like, okay, before we took off, you know, for a drive, do we have water? Do we have dog food? Do we have food for ourselves? And do we have tequila? Okay, we're good to go. Because <laughs> if we break down, we have all the necessities. That's awesome. So, like, you know, you're living in relatively close quarters. You probably learned way more about repairing vehicles than you ever expected, what were maybe, um, you know, do you have any tips or advice just for, you know, living in such a small space? You know, I look at, I, I have a townhouse right now. I've got some roommates. There's a lot of space here, a lot of stuff, right? And I I definitely couldn't pack everything I have in my house into my car right now, uh, despite having an SUV. So what have you guys learned just from, you know, having a small space? I'm sure you downsized before you left, but you probably ditched a bunch of things on the road too that you didn't need. No, I mean, I think the underlying tip is get rid of it, uh, like all of it. <laughs> um, I mean, I, we've, if anything, now we've become like experts at uh, minimal and, and small living. I mean, even now that we're back, you know, we, the place that we converted into our quote unquote perfect home basically a home base, uh, when we're not traveling is 480 square feet. And it feels like a mansion to us. Uh, we recently did another project that's just over 200 square feet and it still feels great because, you know, compared to the van, it's, you know, it's enormous. 
Right. Um, the 60 square foot van. Yeah. And, and so it's, you know, and we're now in, embarking upon another camper and it seems huge. It's just, it's all relative. I mean, in, in much the same way that, you know, a lifestyle is different than another, the amount of things and the amount of space that you live in is all relative. And, you know, we used to live in a five plus bedroom house and every bedroom and the attic and the basement and the garage was slap full. I mean, we couldn't put anything else in it. And we honestly, you know, we called that our forever house. We're going to live there forever. And it all started with one move away. We're trying to kind of move. We moved out of state and we're trying to mix things up. And by the time we came back, it just seemed ridiculous. And we had no desire to live in anything that big ever again. And, you know, a few moves later and a few purges later, it's, it's really kind of funny how, you know, we now share with our clients that there's, it's, it's like a sleep number bed except for, for square footage. Everybody has their number, but there's, there's a certain size space that's kind of perfect for you. And for most people, it's far smaller than kind of what society has pushed us towards living in. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I mean, I, and I almost miss the days of when I was in college, I was even at a point where with my apartment there, I could have packed everything into my car within an hour you know, and, and had everything I needed minus like, you know, my mattress probably wouldn't fit in the car, but you know, I had a sleeping bag and that and everything else I could squeeze into the car. So I, I definitely, um, miss that. And I think that's one of the things that I love about traveling so much is, you know, I just have my one bag with my stuff in it and that's it. Yeah. There's a real freedom with that. But it, but it also takes a very concerted effort and decision. You know, sure. so plus that decision was to collect experiences rather than stuff. Right. And that's not something where you just say, I'm going to go to sleep tonight and tomorrow I'll wake up ready to do that. No, there's a system for sure. <laughs> we, uh, for us, the system was kind of like, you know, I mean, it, it changed over time. The more comfortable you get, the easier it becomes to just push things to the curb. Uh, but in the beginning, you know, we would pack bins with stuff that was questionable and put it away. And if we didn't need it or touch it for a month or two, then we just had a rule that it just went, it would get pushed out to the curb and be, you know, a free sign put on it or it'd go straight to goodwill. Um, because if you open that bin, you're going to pull something back out. There's always, you know, that knee jerk reaction. Oh, I'm going to need that later. Um, but if you can put it away for a little while and you don't need it, chances are you actually don't need it. And somebody else does. And somebody else <laughs> might. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could go to help on help somebody else out. So what's been the plan since you guys got, like, how long have you guys been home? And, um, you know, what have you guys been up to since you got home? Um, well, gosh, we're three and a half years without jobs at this point, which yeah. is amazing. Our trip was um, about a year. So um, we came back to Portland in June of 2013. When we thought that was just a quick trip, you know, we we were still loving life on the road, but you know, things were, things were less impactful and awe inspiring than they were before. And so it was time for, to change things up. And then we Skyped with very dear friends of ours who had had a child while we were gone and we met him over Skype. And so we both broke into tears afterwards and we're like, <laughs> okay, it's time to go home and see friends. Let's go visit. Um, and we came back and thought it was just a quick trip. We actually left the Volkswagen in Costa Rica, flew home and then kind of darted around from, you know, friend's room to friend's basement to renting an apartment. And it slowly became apparent that we were going to stay here longer. And, you know, we still had our house and we, it had been rented the whole time we were gone, but the lease was coming due. And so we were like, okay, are we willing to, you know, bite the bullet and move back into the three bedroom house? And, you know, we just, we hated the idea of taking roommates. We didn't have enough stuff to fill three bedrooms. And we didn't want to pay the the full mortgage. We certainly didn't want to pay the mortgage. That would require jobs. <laughs> right. Um, and so we finally realized that there was this garage that was sitting unused. And so we converted the garage into our house so that we could continue renting the house. That's awesome. And it's, it immediately changed everything in terms of our trajectory because that allowed us to continue having the mortgage paid, to live essentially free month to month except for what it takes for us to eat and drink and now of course to travel um and it's again it's just very funny i mean it's the it's the flashlight story never could have seen it but once you're in that spot where you know 
all you have to find is enough to eat and drink. Suddenly it takes all the pressure off of finding the perfect job. It takes all the pressure off of how hard you have to work. Um, and it gives you the, or it gave me at least the kind of creative freedom to say, wow, what do I, what do I want to do? I mean, do I want to do anything? It's okay if I try something and fail. It's okay if I try something and barely make any money on it at all because barely any money is all we need. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the world is your canvas now and you've got as many paintbrushes and colors of paint as you want. Yeah, one thing um, that was, it's obvious now, but um, was a big learning was when we were working, we had all this money, but we didn't have any freedom. We didn't have any time. We, we couldn't go and travel a bunch. And then phase two, we find ourselves with all this time, but not a ton of money. So that's where we are right now. We're trying to solve that, find that perfect balance. We want to keep our freedom and time. We want to keep our schedules flexible. Um, but we also want to have a little bit more money so that we can go to any exotic vacation that our friends like throw out or go scuba diving, you know, go to the most like pristine beaches of the world. And I know a lot of people solve that. I mean, I, I'm sure if if you interview travelers all the time, I mean, the the common story we hear is, okay, we're going to go home and work for two years, save a lot of money, and then we're going to take off and travel for a year or two. Um, which is a, is a great response. It just, again, I think we're broken. You know, the idea of going back and working for two years sounds just as horrible as going back and working for 20 more years. And so we're, we're, we're hanging on to this idea that there's a gray zone and a middle ground where we can actually find a balance of both. Yeah. And so are you guys, obviously you're, you're in the garage that's next to the house currently. So, and does that make money or is that kind of like a break even type thing? Well, a a funny thing happened after we moved in. I mean, it's, again, the idea was just to let somebody else pay the mortgage. Right. Um, And then obviously we had to find a way to pay off the construction costs of it because we spent the remainder of our travel funds on the construction costs. On the renovation, yeah. Um, And so one of our neighbors actually recommended, we still had to go back and get our bus back from Costa Rica. And so last winter, one of our neighbors recommended that we put it on Airbnb while we traveled. And it was like another light went on. We just, we had never considered that someone might want to pay money to stay in our place. Uh, If anything, we thought we were going to have to pay someone to watch it. Um, (laughs) And so when we took off for Costa Rica, we actually had several people stay in our place and essentially funded, you know, the flight and some of the gas on the way back. And, and so over the course of the last year, as we've been trying to further and further this idea of, of living this way, We've been Airbnb being, you know, different portions throughout the year. And so last summer we, you know, we would put it on Airbnb for a month. Somebody would book a week and then we'd close out the other three weeks. And that would be the week we would go backpack and see the Northwest. <laughs> and that was fun because we would look at each other and say, so where do you want to go during that week? Do you want to go to <laughs> Vancouver, BC? Do you want to go backpacking? Do you want to go to wine country? Where should we go? Hit the coast and surf. Vegas. <laughs> and so it's, it's, you know, it's again, we've, we've, we find ourselves back home, quote unquote, for now, but almost more nomadic than we were when we were on the road um, because we're kind of at other people's whims. And, and it's proven to be great for us because we, we've lived in the Northwest for a long time. And every year we feel like we didn't take advantage of it. We didn't see enough of it. We didn't explore and backpack enough of it. And so, you know, the last the years since we've been back from our trip, we're, we actually feel like we're doing those things. That's awesome. Awesome. You guys, this is such a cool story. And it, it's, it kind of makes me want to go like, you know, renovate my garage, because we have a garage in the townhouse and just Airbnb out the house. But I think my three roommates would be a little upset about that. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's funny, because Portland is kind of leading the charge on a movement uh, that seems to be evolving in kind of tiny housing, whether it be you know, little 180 square foot houses on wheels, or whether it be accessory dwelling units, which is formally what our garage is now called. Um, but it's it's really interesting to see the number of people that are gravitating towards this movement, while others are still, you know, building larger and larger homes to collect more and more stuff. Yeah. And I mean, I've watched some pretty cool documentaries on it. I mean, we're not talking, you're just living in a box. There are some very nice, uh, tiny homes out there and, and very accommodating to, you know, the comforts that some people still like to, to retain. 
Absolutely. Um, we wake up every morning feeling like we're in a, in a spa. I mean, our <laughs> garage, you know, everybody seems to have this vision of living in a damp, cold space. But after the renovation we did, honestly, we wake up feeling like we're in a resort somewhere. Yeah, the beauty, the beauty is that you design the space to be your perfect home. You know, what are all the things you want to accomplish in it? Do you want to be able to have, you know, 20 people over for, you know, a, a party? Or do you, you know, do you want to be able to have 10 people for dinner? And even if it's 300, 400 square feet, there's creative solutions to, to be able to have everything you want. You don't have to deprive yourself of anything. That's great. So to look forward into the future, you know, just having been on this awesome journey and been home for a little while to see friends, um, you know, what do you guys see just around everything off, you know, for the future? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> If there's one thing that we've realized uh, we're really poor at, it's planning. Um, it's hard for us to say where we're going to be in a week, much less a month or a few years. But the trajectory seems right. Um, I mean, it, it, again, at this point, I think it's it's all about balance. I mean, <laughs> and I feel like we're kind of living that right now, but we've been spending maybe a little too much time getting the projects done. And so it's nice that we're moving into kind of a freedom point on that as well, where we're teetering back towards having more time instead of less and maybe a little more money instead of less. And, you know, it, it's, it's an ebb and flow and certainly it's never, you know, we, we are not rowing in the money, let's be clear, but we seem to be finding ourselves with, you know, obviously enough to comfortably kind of eat and drink and go hang out with friends. And, you know, we're starting to talk about where we want to travel and that's, that was the goal. Um, so yeah. the next few years are definitely going to see, more travel. Uh, we're outfitting a, another camper right now so that we'll be excited to hit the road a little more and not worry about breaking down as often. That's <laughs> stellar. Um, and I, you know, I think the goal seems to be that if you can be as excited to get on a plane or get in the van and drive back home as you are to leave home for your trip, that's a pretty good place to be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, um, we have a super sweet dog and our travel for the next you know three to five years while she's still you know part of our tribe is um is going to be road-based because we want we, you know we don't want to shack her up with our friends and take off for two months to asia we'd rather you know drive up to alaska and camp or drive down to mexico or you know do some do some local pacific northwest stuff with her so that's sort of our are sort of short term and then longer term, I'm, we're going to sail. Some I don't know how we're going to afford this sailboat, but we are going to buy a catamaran and we're going <laughs> to learn how to sail and we are going to scuba dive and snorkel and catch lobster and yeah, we're going to do all that. That sounds amazing. I'm a little bit jealous, so I think I'm going to have to add a few more things to my bucket list here. Well, not, not only do we not know how we're going to afford the sailboat, we also don't know how to sail. So um, there's a lot of unknowns here. Technicalities. Technicalities. So one recommendation I will make is I interviewed a very cool family, um, the Hemingways, on the podcast. And they actually, uh, as a family, uh, bought a catamaran and went sailing for like two and a half years. And I think at one point, his wife, they stopped in Israel and she had a baby. Um, and at like another point, their daughter got engaged to this guy she met while they were out sailing. So... Um, you never know what could happen, and I, I think they went into it with no experience whatsoever. So, it's uh, it's pretty neat. Well, thank you guys so much for for joining me here today. Is there any sort of like last words or just you know advice on go out and, and to experience the world and uh, and maybe like a, a website to check out what you guys are doing and keep up with everything? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, we still. Uh, we're not as good at it anymore, but we still keep to the blog that we started on our travels updated, which is just the dangers dot com with a Z. Um, from there, you can get the links to our design work and other things that we've been doing in the in the meantime. But I, I mean, in terms of advice, I guess for us, it's the same thing Jen kept chanting to me for ten years, which was "leap and the net will appear." You know, we've got a quote on our wall in the garage here that's a Mary Oliver quote that says, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And 
we kind of use that as a conversation starter when people come over. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's a way to try and focus in on what's truly important to you and how do you want to get there. And certainly if anybody, uh, wants to talk about these things, give us a ring or come on over for happy hour. I mean, this, <laughs> these are the conversations that, that light us up and that keep us going. And so if all we did all day was talk about freedom and dreams and goals and how to get to them, we'd, we'd be, we'd be in a pretty happy place. Sweet spot. Good stuff. Well, thank you guys so much for, for taking some time with me. And I know that if I get out that way, I, I'm still missing. I haven't been to Portland or that sort of area. So I know it's on my map for the next year. And uh, we'll definitely have to hit you guys up. Yep. Awesome. Let us know when you're coming. Cool. Thanks, guys. I'll talk to you soon. It's been okay. a pleasure. Thanks. Hey, everyone. It's Zeph. Did you like this episode? Be sure to subscribe so that you can tune in next week and tell a friend about the show. If you want access to free training and exclusive interviews on success, happiness, lifestyle design, and adventure, visit me at yearofpurpose.com. Until next time, go out and let life surprise you so that you can live a life rescripted. scripted